I'm going to use a microphone if you don't mind. I'm, I'm a former teacher, so I can talk loudly, but I, I also am hard of hearing, and so I appreciate microphones, and so I hope you don't mind telling me to use it as well. So, well, good morning, everybody. My name is Stacy Martin, and uh, my mom is the wonderful Joanne Dotson over there. Mm -hmm. She's pretty cool. We definitely like her. We're going to keep her around. Um, big, big part of our lives. Uh, and I know that she gives a lot to, to you all and to this community, and uh, she's pretty special to us. So when uh, my mom and Diane Diana uh, asked me to um, come speak this morning. I was very excited, um, mostly because I was, it would allow me to wear real clothes. Um, right now I'm a stay-at-home mommy, and I have a five-month-old, and so most days I might get out of my pajamas around two o'clock, maybe, before I have to go pick up the other three kids from school. But, um, so it was, it was nice to go into my closet and find something other than a t-shirt. Um, but I also was excited to come because uh, I love Buchanan, and I love the people of Buchanan, and I think that'll be pretty evident as I walk through uh, this presentation. Um, I have a presentation, but I, I tend to go on tangents and speak off. So um, this is going to kind of provide a little background for us, but who knows where this morning will take us, really. Um, so I, uh, I'd like to, to, to kind of preface this by saying that my, my whole passion in life, um, other than my children and, and being a good wife uh, to my husband, is um, storytelling. And I truly believe that everyone has a story to tell. And you're gonna see how that kind of weaves through uh, my history here. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and then we'll talk a little bit about the books. Okay, so I grew up here in Buchanan. I am a born and raised Buchanan buck. Uh, my parents grew up in Buchanan. I'm the product of two uh, high school sweethearts who met in FFA. You can read their story uh, in this book right here. I actually write about their story. Um, the title of that story is called Pink Carnations and Pickup Trucks. And uh, so they have a, a, a lovely little tale um, that the rest of us kids like to tell all the time because, because of them, all of these kids right here on the cover are around. So um, this is me growing up. That's at my grandma's house. Um, I was the oldest grandchild around and, and had lots of uh, cousins to grow up with. As you all know, Buchanan is uh, the best place to raise a family, the best place to grow up, and uh, my experience was no exception. Um, but I was a bit of probably an old soul because while the rest of my friends were jamming out to Debbie Gibson and Tiffany, I found this set of cassette tapes. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but um, at, at about eight years old, I was a huge fan of public radio. And I loved Wisconsin public radio. And they had a guy on there named Garrison Keeler. And Garrison Keeler uh, was the host of a Prairie Home Companion. And again, everybody else is listening to music from the 80s, and I am listening to the radio. Um, I'm listening to this variety show. And um, un on uh, Prairie Home Companion, there was always a section called the News from Lake Wobegon. And Garrison Keeler would tell about a story um, that it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, his hometown, and he would talk about uh, what life was like back home that week, back on the prairie, and there would just be these ordinary tales of ordinary people, and I just found them fascinating. So I could have cared less about superstars and, and rock stars. I just wanted to know about what Mrs. Krebsback was doing back home <laughs> in Lake Wobegon. And my grandma gave me these tapes, these cassette tapes, and, they were, and I listened to them over and over and over and over and over. I would, love, I would love to lay in my bed at night with my Walkman and just listen to them. And so combine that, and I'm talking about my grandma Dotson at this point, so I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she loved it, and so we would listen to them together. Well, I also spent a lot of time at both grandparents' houses, and also at my grandma Dotson's house, she was a big fan of Irma Bombeck. Again, old soul, I'm like nine years old reading Irma Bombeck. And I loved her because, again, ordinary people, ordinary tales, she just talked about motherhood. And, but it was so funny. She pulled out all of the really funny things about being a mom. Just average, ordinary life, and I just found it fascinating. Um, so again, that theme is the stories of ordinary people doing ordinary things, but really picking up on those, the, the magic and the mundane. 
Um, because I'm sure if you think back on your lives, usually the, those little things, when you think back, were really the big things. And so that's, that's kind of been um, what my passion is throughout my life. Now, you combine that with a family that loved campfires and campfire stories. And I grew up listening to my dad and my uncles talk about the glory days back in high school and playing football in 1979 and uh, playing against Lakeshore and beating the, the, the Lakeshore football team and just all of these wonderful hunting stories and fishing stories. And as a little girl, I don't countless times, I would fall asleep around a campfire just listening to those stories, that oral history of my family just being passed down. Again, ordinary people, but just incredible stories. And then one of the greatest influences on my life uh, was my grandpa Dotson. So I don't know if any of you remember him. He passed away um, right before my son was born. And my son is gonna be 13 this year. And my grandpa Dotson was a newspaper man. And he uh, wrote for the South Bend Tribune. Well, he wrote all his life. Um, he wrote while he was up in Alaska. He wrote for the South Bend Tribune. Um, and then when he retired, he kept writing and he wrote this column called The Dotson Farm. And the Dotson Farm was this tiny little homestead farm that in his stories was bigger than life. And so he would talk about the Dotson Farm every week. And it just, it was a fascinating way to learn about what it was like living off the land from, from my grandpa. Um, and, and I think I took a lot of his storytelling um, concepts really to heart. And he was a writer. And, and I'd like to think that I get some of my writing skills from him. So these are kind of the influences to set you up here. Well, you can have influences, but then you have to have your own stories to tell. So you have to have your own experiences. And um, I'm 40 now, just turned 40 this year, and so I've had um, a fair share of experiences. When I graduated from high school, I went to Grand Valley. Um, after Grand Valley, I decided that I wanted to go out to Washington, D.C. and uh, discover what life was like in the big city. So I went out there and I worked for the close-up organization in Washington, D.C. Um, it was fascinating, wonderful. I worked 80 hours a week and I made about 400 bucks a week. It was just, it was wonderful. They really knew how to just use those eager college students. Um, and we would get students from all over the country, all over the world, really. So every week, on Sunday, a new crop of students would come in and they would mix them all up together. So you'd have students from tiny towns like Buchanan being roommates with students from New York City or from Puerto Rico or from Texas. And they would mix them all up and I would get about 20 of them and I would take them around the city all week long. So we'd talk in the morning about the legislative process. In the afternoon, I'd take them up to Capitol Hill. We'd go and I, they'd meet their congressperson, they'd meet their senators. We would go into committee meetings. We'd go into the chamber and watch. And that would be on a Tuesday. On a Wednesday, I'd talk about the Supreme Court. That night we would go, or that afternoon we would go to the Supreme Court and listen to oral arguments. So it was just this fascinating experience, very fast paced, a ton of work, but really taught me um, that there are stories, not just in Buchanan, but there are stories all throughout, and these just these kids had incredible stories to tell as well. I worked this program called the Program for New Americans, and these were kids um, whose parents had immigrated here, and they were brand new Americans, and, and I learned their stories as well. Well, I couldn't stay out there forever. I'm a hometown girl. And so eventually I came back. I always knew I'd come back to Buchanan. And I was a high school teacher at Buchanan High School for about a decade. And that was fantastic. I was a, a history teacher up there, of course, naturally, right? History is just storytelling. That's all it is. Um, I realized that history was storytelling and I wanted to be a history teacher because when I was a sophomore, I had Mrs. Ryder as a history teacher. This is Ruth Ryder. And we had the best assignment I've ever been given. She said, here's what you have to do. I want you to go home and I want you to talk to your grandparents and interview them and record it. And so I thought, well, that's easy enough. So I got all of my grandparents around a table, my mom's mom, my mom's grandma, um, my dad, my dad's dad, I got all of them around the table and, I, and we had an old camcorder and I just started asking stories, I started asking questions. Now these are people I had known my entire life, but I got brand new stories because all I had never really asked them before. And so everybody has a story to tell if you just ask them. So 
a couple of those stories are in this book, but my favorite one is um, my great grandma, Grandma Elvie. She was about 80 pounds soaking wet. She thought that the camcorder was off, and then she started telling the real stories. <laughs> so she told this story about how now they grew up in Arkansas about during Prohibition, how my grandpa Leonard made the best moonshine <laughs> in the entire county. And she would help them. And so they would go out into the woods and they had this big bathtub and they would make it all. And then she was the lookout. So she would stand out on the road and if she saw any lights coming, she'd holler back to my great grandpa and tell him to, you know, shut it down. Well, every week they would pour it into two big jugs and they'd put the two big jugs into a suitcase. Every week, because my grandma didn't drive, she would go to the bus stop with her suitcase. She'd get on the bus, and the bus driver would say, Ellie, what you got in that suitcase? And she'd say, moonshine. And she'd say, yeah, right, woman, get on this bus. And she would get on the bus, and she would go and sell the moonshine to the sheriff. <laughs> every week. Now, had I not asked, I would have never known that story and many other stories like the fact that my dad's family got here because my my great great grandpa who was 13 at the time was a stowaway from Sweden got on a got on a ship heading here to the United States they didn't realize he was on it until they were halfway here and so they put him to work and then eventually came here to the United States again everybody has fascinating stories to tell forget about the celebrities Ordinary people have the best, most extraordinary stories. So that takes me to high school. I loved it. I was part of the group that started the herd with those students. Um, it was just a, a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. I loved every second of it. Um, but I had babies at home, and my babies started going to school. And then what I found was that I was teaching other people's babies while somebody else was taking care of my babies, and in my head that just didn't seem to that didn't seem to fit. So I decided that I was going to leave this job, which I loved, and one night, I'm not kidding you, this is what happened, it's at 10 o'clock at night in October, and I was laying in my bed, I had my, my third baby by that time, and I Googled flexible jobs for moms, and up popped real estate, and I thought, I'll do that. So I got my real estate license, oh my became a real estate agent because you can take your babies along with you to your to your listing um, and so that's what I did well while I was home doing that um, I really felt like I needed some kind of creative outlet because remember I've been teaching for years and my creative outlet was speaking and talking with students and working and, and coming up with all kinds of crazy lesson plans and now I was I was stay at, I was staying home with my little baby and working on the side so I started writing and started writing on Facebook and it really it just started out as um, I would just kind of talk about the day, like the funny things about, think back to Irma Bombeck. It was just like, this was, you know, this was a funny thing that happened today. And I would just share it on my personal Facebook. Well, I started getting a lot of people commenting on it. Oh, that's funny, you should share that. And then one night, one of my friends messaged me and she said, you know, have you ever thought about starting a blog? And I thought, no, not really, but I did. So I started a blog and it just kind of took off from there. So this was my first blog. It was called Laying Down Roots. And these are my babies, three of them. That's them dancing at a party. Um, and it was just stories of small town life and love. And um, those blogs, I wrote 75 essays. Um, they got picked up for national publications. Um, they got picked up, and I, I used to write a column for the Barron County Record um, years, years ago. Uh, it would, they would appear in the South Bend Tribune. And so they just started getting picked up. One of the one of the essays I wrote about my mom, actually, um, that one went viral. I'd never had anything go viral before, and that one had um, 700,000 readers. So wow. that was pretty fun. Um, it was cool that it was about her, obviously. And so that one's in the book, too. Uh, so these are ex my experiences, but I'm really just collecting those stories along the way, just like you have. If you think back to your life, what are some of those highlights? What would be the chapters in your storybook? All right, well, not every life is um, just full of all sunshine, right? That would make for a really boring story if it was all just wonderful and sunshine and everything that we put on social media is glittery and beautiful, but that's not real life. And so all along the way, I've also been learning a lot of lessons. There are peaks and valleys in every story. Um, 
once my third baby went to school, I decided um, I needed to you know, go back into the workforce and I wanted to try something different. So that's when I started at Honor Credit Union. And for about, I worked there for four years. I was the vice president of marketing. So I took my skills that I learned um, and, and I told the story of Honor. And I told the story of um, the members at Honor. So this is part of my team here. And that was a great, a great experience, a great team to be on. During that time, um, I also started my very first podcast. And this podcast, I was sponsored by um, the studio, NBI Studios, and it was called Hustlin' in Heels. And we had 50,000 listeners. Wow. Can you imagine that? Isn't that silly? <laughs> and it was, the idea was everybody has a story, but the specific stories I told in this one um, were stories of women who were hustling. Women who were trying to do it all, who may be in business, who, who were in business or who were in um, different industries and kind of how they, how they navigated that and how they handled life maybe as a wife and mom and a, and a, a career woman. So I told stories of um, Jen Tabor was one of my guests. She is the creator of Soldier Guitar Straps, which if you don't know her, it's based in Buchanan. It is the, the world's premier guitar strap maker. I mean, yeah. think of a famous musician, they have, they have soldier guitar straps made here in Buchanan, Michigan. So stories like that, I, I, it was an interview uh, segment because I always love talking to people and just hearing their stories. So I started that. In the meantime, I also was a part of this group here um, that, that it's called the Leadership Accelerator in Bering County, Southwest Michigan. And you get picked to be on this and it's kind of like up and coming leaders, but the whole point of it is you get to make these connections. Well, it's great, I loved it, loved all these people, but I've learned here that there are a lot of diverse stories to tell as well. It's not just a single story, and there's a real danger in a single story if you just think about somebody as one dimensional. And so that's what I learned there. Now, talking about those valleys, this all looks great, doesn't it? I'm part of the Leadership Accelerator. I'm an up and coming leader in Southwest Michigan. I have a podcast with 50,000 listeners. I have this really super great job. I gotta tell you, completely unhappy. <laughs> Things were not working. Things were not clicking. Um, I was missing something. I had what a lot of people call a God-shaped hole. I was searching and searching and searching and searching and couldn't fill it. So I was trying to fill it with career. I was trying to fill it with fame. I was trying to fill it with people. And in September of 2017, I had finally just had enough. And on Tuesday, I was like, you know what? Something's just not working here. Got all these out external things, but something's not working in here. So I bought a plane ticket for Colorado. And on Friday, I left for Colorado, and I went for a hike in the woods for about four days. Hike in the mountains, I should say. By myself. My parents were thrilled. <laughs> when you're out in the mountains, you can't really tell where somebody is, right? And I was doing it by myself. I took a knife in my backpack. It was fine. Um, and on the top of a mountain in Colorado, um, I, I kind of had this moment where I was kind of saying, well, what should I be doing with my life? I've got all these external things that are great, but I'm just unhappy. And I'm not sure how to fill that. I just keep trying to find things, trying to search for things, trying to fill it up, but nothing seems to be filling it up. And I feel like at that moment, God was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. If you keep looking in all those areas, you're not going to find it. There's only one way that you can have that eternal peace. So I came back home and I wrote a blog about it, about meeting God on a mountain. And there was this friend I had at work um, and he uh, was a believer, and he asked me out to dinner and said, I'd love to hear about your story about on the mountain. And uh, so I went out to dinner with him. <clears throat> That's him. Well, that dinner turned into a conversation, um, shared the gospel with me for the first time. That conversation turned into a going to church eventually and turned into uh, being baptized a couple of years ago. And that friendship turned into a marriage, which turned into this little guy right here. Um, and, and what I found is that um, all of these stories are very, very important, um, but it's the, 
the story that we're really looking forward to is that story of salvation. And so that salvation really became my motivation and everything changed. That story of um, my experience of going from a, a non-believer, critic, atheist to uh, uh, um, a follower of Jesus is, is this book right here. So that's, called, that's why it's called New Girl at Church. So I know this is not a, a religious uh, talk, but I feel like if I didn't talk to you about that, because that's so much about of who I am, that I wouldn't be very genuine. So that's that story. So what I do is storytelling. Um, I now stay at home. I'm a full-time mom to four kiddos. And uh, my husband, that handsome, big, tall guy named Dave, uh, he works hard so I can stay home. And what I do is I story tell. So I, I have written two books. Um, and then I started a podcast. For those of you that don't know what podcasts are, think Garrison Keillor, NPR, radio, but just take it to 2020. Now, podcasts are just like radio. Um, they're free. You have access to them on your phone. Uh, I'll show you different ways you can find them. There's a podcast about everything. Literally everything you could be interested in, there's a podcast out there about it. And so I started a podcast called The Folks Back Home. And the idea behind this is everybody has a story to tell if you only just ask them. And I love my hometown, and I know there are ordinary people living extraordinary lives in, in our hometown, and so that's what I do. Every week I sit down with somebody in my studio that I made out in my, my house, um, and I just ask them their story. You might recognize some of these faces. These are just some of the people who have been on the podcast so far. Um, so let's see, Scarecrow Ladies. They were on last week. Jeannie Harris, this is probably a familiar face to you here. Incredible story. Um, I have the owners of River St. Joe, Buchanan Bucks softball team that were the uh, co champ or the runners up for state. Um, Tracy Dippo, Dave Dippo, the hardware store. So there are, this is just some of them. And every week I release a podcast. It's just an interview with somebody from our hometown, and I just asked them a life story. Remember how I never knew my grandma was a bootlegger <laughs> until I asked her? Well, you will be impressed and surprised by the stories that these people that you know, you think you know, you'll be so surprised by their life stories. They're just beautiful. So I'll show you how, how to get access to that. So that's what I do now. I write books and I tell stories, and I, um, my, the stories are my stories, but they're also the stories of, of just everyday, ordinary people. So, that's my presentation part. Do you have any questions before I read you a little story? I'm gonna take a drink of water. Did you go to close up with Buchanan High School? I did. Yep, with Mrs. Ryder. So I went to close up and loved it so much I knew that I wanted to go back and be a teacher at Close Up. Yeah, Close Up was a great group. It was founded in 1971 for the purpose. It's a nonpartisan group, and it's actually funded by Congress too, and for the purpose of getting kids and to be able to experience civic education. So not just learn about it in books, but actually go there. Any other questions before I show you a couple more things? Okay, if you are interested in this podcast huh all right diana i might have broken your tv i'm going to show you how to access it does anybody in here have an iphone do you have iphones okay if you have an iphone you can get it right on your phone there's a little purple icon that says podcast Apple builds it right in for you. I got that. Yep. You can get it that way. But I tried to make it easy um, for those that, that don't know how to. My dad's so funny. You know, my dad's only, what is he, 59. Right, Mom? 59. And I'll say, Dad, just get it just get it on the podcast app. And he'll say, would you stop telling me to do this? Just, just send me the link. <laughs> just, to, just do it on my phone for me. So I've learned a lot through him because... I try to make it easy for everybody because podcasts, I've been listening for 10 years, but you know, we're in the middle of the country. So things tend to get here a little bit slower from the coast. And uh, so I try to make podcasts very easy for everyone to access. So if you are interested in accessing the podcast, I just 
I do have a website. It's called thefolksbackhome.com. And if you go on thefolksbackhome.com, I try to make it very easy for you. So here is the page. If you click out on podcast, see there's a menu right here? You can put in your first name, last name, and email. And every Tuesday when I release a new episode, I'll just send it to you. I have a, quite a list right now of, of people. I don't spam. I don't have time to spam. I only send out an email every Tuesday with the link. That's all it is. Yes? What, is the, what was the email again? The, the folksbackhome.com. Okay. <clears throat> now, if you just go out there and click on podcast and you don't want me to email it to you, they're all out there too. So the latest episode was the Scarecrow Ladies, Mark Nixon, Dr. Bob White, who's from Buchanan and started the uh, NICU at Memorial. Fascinating episode. Jeannie Harris, Mr. Proud. That one gets a lot of feedback. Mm -hmm. That one was great. Lanny Fisher, he talks about his dad as well. Um, Al Fisher, James Busby. Uh, there's the softball team. Um, River St. Joe, Dave and Tracy Dippo. These are seniors who graduated last year. Um, our city commissioners, Mr. Jared Flinner, I'm sure that's a familiar uh, voice to you all. And then the first episode was with Mark Fry, who is our um, head football coach for the Bucks, and he's our athletic director. And if you haven't met him yet, because he's newer to our area, I would highly recommend that episode. He, the things that he is doing with our young athletes is pretty incredible. Um, he, is, he is sure he wants them to win on the field, but he wants them to be good humans. And so he is including um, them in a lot of, they do leadership lessons and life lessons, just a fascinating guy. So that's, um, those are all out there. Again, feel free to, to put your email address in and I'll send it to you. Um, I'll show you the top here. And then if you're interested, I do have a link to the book out there as well. It'll take you right to Amazon. And then every once in a while when I have time and the baby sleeps a little bit longer, uh, I write a blog. So this is a, an article about uh, the young entrepreneurs at the farmer's market just a couple weeks ago. So that's all out there for you if that's something that you're interested in. Um, any questions about that? I would love for you to listen to a podcast episode. Uh, I think you'll find them insightful, but also fun. There's no commercials, so that's helpful. You can listen to them on demand. I like to listen to podcasts when I'm folding my laundry or putting the dishes away. Um, and it just kind of gives me those feelings of old back throwback radio, um, just listening to stories. Because when you just listen to people, you can kind of envision stories in your mind that are a lot better than the ones you would actually see. Any questions about this? All right, I'm going to read you a story. A lot of people have asked, <clears throat> why did I title this book, We Grow Kids Here? So I'm going to tell you why. <clears throat> I've never read my book out loud before. It's the very first time. <laughs> this is titled, We Grow Kids Here. The four ingredients necessary for an amazing summer are the exact same four ingredients required to sustain plant life. Water, sun, air, and soil. Children and plants, if given those four things, will thrive during the hottest months of the year. We adults tend to require a few more ingredients to get by. We like to add, <clears throat> we like to add fancy art projects and expensive sports camps, required reading time, and structured play dates. We like to complicate things that don't always need to be complicated. We overschedule, overcommit, and overdo. We could learn a thing or two from dandelions and our little ones. Today I watched as 100 kids splashed through a field that was turned into a giant puddle by a fire truck spraying a constant steam of water overhead. A hillbilly splash pad, if you will. 
Our local library and our city fire department sponsored the annual splash day and it's always a big hit. The truck's water made a giant cascading arch under which the children ran, slid, jumped, splashed, chased, and laughed for a full hour. It was one heck of a sprinkler. Everywhere I looked, there were barefooted children covered in grass, soaked from head to toe and grinning from ear to ear. Groups of friends who hadn't seen each other since school, let out in early June, were reunited for an afternoon. Younger brothers and sisters who tentatively followed their older siblings around at the beginning of the hour soon grew brave and ventured out to jump in their own puddles. Little girls held hands and screamed as they ran to the middle. Little boys competed to see who could slide the farthest on their bellies in the mud. The closest thing to a planned activity or a structured event occurred when the guys who worked for the city, dads and uncles themselves, pulled up to the field in an ATV loaded down with water balloons to pass out to the kids. There weren't any instructions to go along with the handout. The kids weren't required to line up and play catch with them or even wait in line to get their balloon. It was a free-for-all, both during and after the handout, and it was awesome. Five minutes of an all-out, take-no-prisoners, water balloon war, reminiscent of the epic dodgeball games played in gym class back in the good old days before safety concerns and overbearing adults got in the way of all the fun. Let's see. There we go. My greatest summer memories growing up contain those same ingredients. Many hot days were spent at the beach with my mom and dad, uncles and aunts, siblings and cousins, we would pack a cooler and stay for hours, digging moats and swimming to the sandbar. I remember building giant sandcastles and adding embellishments with items we found on the beach. Driftwood for drawbridges, rocks for walkways, and old cigarette butts for staircases. There was no structure to the day besides the obligatory hike up the sand dune, and we only brought one toy, a football, to play catch in the lake. As we got older, we rolled out our towels farther down the beach from our parents basking in the sun and a tiny little bit of freedom. One particular memory involves my best friend and I when we were 13 years old, sitting on our towels about 20 yards away from my dad who had volunteered to be our, chef, our chauffeur and chaperone for the day. A thankless job when you're dealing with teenage girls. My little sister soon joined us and was receiving a first-hand lesson in gossip when we saw two cute boys headed in our direction. My friend leaned over and whispered, Let's tell them we're 16. <laughs> and in the same low voice and with all sincerity, my nine-year-old sister added, tell them I'm 10. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do when you have all the right ingredients. You grow. You dig your toes into the earth and you plant your feet on solid ground. You gain strength and energy from the rays of the sun and you lift your face toward its warmth. You find renewal in the cleansing power of the rain and learn to dance in it too. The warm breeze that carries the smell of lilacs and lavender can chase away even the biggest worries. Ah, to have many summers is a privilege denied to many, and its simple pleasures are enjoyed by too few. There's an organic beauty in a minimalistic summer composed of those four life-sustaining ingredients. God knew what he was doing when he sent the soft summer rain to cool off the dog days of July and the sun's afternoon encore to dry the blades of grass for the evening picnic. Should you doubt the power of those four simple elements on the demeanor of your children, simply hook up a cheap sprinkler to an old garden hose and place it out in your yard. Then sit back in your lawn chair and watch the magic happen. No need to coordinate or orchestrate. They will leap and race and slide and giggle all on their own. The less intervention, the better. Kids and trees grow best when they have the space to stretch out their branches. A few years back, we were spending a late summer evening with family at a relative's house while my grandfather was spending his last days surrounded by those who loved him the most. My grandpa was a man who lived his life outdoors and instilled the love of nature in many of his descendants. From him, I learned how to make maple syrup, boil sassafras tea, identify a dogwood tree by its bark, it. <laughs> and call back to a Katie did. We spent thousands of hours walking through trails in the woods or fishing in a canoe or just sitting on the grass talking. He didn't need much more than water, soil, air, and sun to make life worth living and to make memories with his grandkids. 
while we kept a round-the-clock watch by his bedside. A few of the adults ventured outside in the cool air to watch the kids stretch their legs in a fierce game of, street, of freeze tag. In the midst of the match, some of the kids trampled right through my Aunt Marcia's beautiful flower bed. The parents quickly made a move to reprimand their children, but before they could get out a full sentence, my aunt, who was my grandpa's sister, turned to the parents and said, you let those babies be. They aren't hurting anything. We grow kids here, not flowers. Oh. You bet we do. We grow kids here, and we grow, grow right along with them too. And if we're lucky, we'll get to enjoy many summers growing together. We don't need all the trappings of the modern world to enjoy it either. All we need is already outside our front door. A sunburned nose and dirty toes, wind-blown hair, and water everywhere. Proof of a life well lived. Thanks for letting me get through that. I haven't read that out loud. It's about my grandpa. <laughs> What questions do you have? I know we have a little bit of time left. I did not prepare a song and dance, so. What's that? You so thorough. Oh. <laughs> so, um, what are, what, how many of you grew up here? Okay. So when you think about your life um, growing up here, what are some of those favorite memories that you think about? If anybody would like to share. Well, for myself, I actually moved here in the end of my fifth grade year, so I consider it home. Mm -hmm. And I remember just being able to be on the bicycle and just, I lived out in Sampson Terrace, and just coming into town and just driving, going to Stips and to the sweet shop and up to Wesner Back and all these fun places and just and all the just looking at all the homes we're riding our bicycles and going to the parks. To me, that's my favorite memory yeah. of you know growing up here. Just all that fun stuff in that small little town and the small you know seeing the you know the stores and everything. Yes, Wesner Beck, I forgot about that until you yeah. just said that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. What was that about when the, when the Royal Mounted Rise Again? Uh, it would have been in the 40s, let's see, probably in 44, 46, somewhere in there. That's so cool. That's very cool. Yes? I went every week, too. <laughs> On Saturday afternoon when I was younger, on Friday nights when I got a little older. Yeah. But it was double feature, uh, five comics, a cereal, and it didn't cost much. And and then put on the movie back afterwards. Did you get a news reel? Pardon me? Was there a news reel? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah the news there was reel. a news reel? Mm -hmm. Was that at the beginning of the movie? Uh, yes. Ah. OK. But we lived at the uh, edge of city limits on 4th Street. Uh, the little house was just past the apartments there. Hmm. We there for 10 years ago. Where was the movie theater at? Right in the middle of town. Right. If you came down Main Street, you'd almost drive into it. Hmm. Where, the walkway is. where the walkway is, where Mill Alley is now. That's what that's what we call it these days, huh? You you're gonna say something in the back. I I was an to graduate. So you you remember the A K Wee? Aaron K Wee? Yep. J V softball team. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. He was he was um I was on the team. That was based a month ago. So. Yep. He remembers you guys. Yes. Yeah, he was a wonderful a man. Good, great, good coach. He was. He was a wonderful man. Gave a lot of his life to that softball program. We appreciated that. Yeah. 
So some of you went to the movie theaters. Some of you went to elementary school here. When I interviewed Mr. Proud, I learned that there used to be a Dewey school, which I never knew about. Anybody go to Dewey school? Okay. Um, uh, so that's one of the things. He also, Mr. Proud also talked about going downtown and getting a strawberry malt above the, uh, or at the bowling alley. Didn't know there was a bowling alley here in town. Um, and so just a lot of those memories that are coming up in uh, that really, you know, shows that Buchanan is such an interesting town with such a rich history. Um, and that everybody really has a, a part of that. Uh, a lot of the tales that come up are about teachers, about the impact that teachers have made, the impact that coaches have made. Uh, there's a story in there about um, Mr. Muncha, who was a, um, was my teacher, and then I had the privilege of teaching with him when I went back to school. And then my son, my oldest of the four, uh, had the privilege of um, working with him and, and wrestling and, and all that kind of good stuff. And um, so there's a story in there about him, about the impact that he made as well. And so just a lot of, uh, again, everyday, ordinary stories like the one that I, uh, I read to you all, so. All right, any other? You're good? Okay, all right, well thank you so much for um, coming. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, the website's up there. If you weren't able to access the website, if you open up your phone and, and pull up your camera and put it on this, it'll bring a website right up. That's called the QR code, kind of cool. Um, and I will be at the farmer's market this Saturday, actually, selling um, both books and signing books and, um, you know, making grocery money. <laughs> That's what I do. That's how I spend all of my <laughs> groceries for children. So, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.